Well, welcome, welcome, Fred. We greatly appreciate your leadership and solidarity. As always, we begin all things by giving thanks to our creator, to the original stewards of the various lands we're on. We also acknowledge our ancestors. We acknowledge all those who toiled without compassion or compensation. We acknowledge all those elders and community stalwarts whose shoulders we stand on as we share, build, and learn together for our collective liberation and sovereignty. So Fred, can you please introduce yourself to our listeners and viewers and share a little bit about your remarkable work? Okay, well, my name is Fred Weingust. I uh, was born and live in the city of Toronto, Canada. I just turned 65. I've spent uh, a good part of my life working for a large corporate conglomerate known as IBM. And after uh, I retired from there, and I put the word retired in quotes, uh, I eventually found my way to RENA, an organization that uh, provides uh, services and supports to individuals with uh, uh, diverse abilities, many of them who have some type of developmental disability. Uh, the project that I've been working on was a long shot project initially. Um, we were looking at a type of creative programming that needed to be done during the COVID pandemic. We had a challenge that many of our individuals were highly susceptible to COVID, uh, living in, in congregate care environments. And whenever there was an outbreak, uh, we could not allow them or their support staff to go out and shop for food. And in fact, we ended up buying Meals on Wheels, shipping it to our various locations as people were uh, isolated. Eventually that got us to thinking, um, if we wanna really avoid this problem or at least you know, start solving this problem, we should think a little bit more about the food security for the individuals that we are supporting. Many of them uh, live on a disability pension uh, in other words, not very much money and uh, really are on the, uh, in a lot of cases, uh, if it wasn't that they were uh, living with us, they would be on the margins of society. So we want to make sure that the individuals who are with us, who we support, uh, are, you know, have been given the best opportunities. And it's not just food, it's also employment. So we started to think about this concept of the Rena Community Farm, of teaching our own staff and the individuals that they support how to grow food for themselves. And we had to find a very simple system that would work, uh, that could be easily taught and then easily followed. We succeeded in finding that type of system. And it meant that we could grow on the ground as opposed to in the ground, uh, put in the proper soil, put in the proper fertilizer. And once we standardized on the plants that we were growing, we were able to uh, standardize our education, push it out to, uh, 28 of our 35, uh, 34 group homes, uh, two of our apartment buildings, many independent uh, individuals who live in their own apartments, but who wanted to be part of the program. And eventually we had everyone involved in uh, growing their own food during the summer months in Canada, um, and then bringing it in and making it part of their meal. That eventually evolved to then seeing what could we do 12 months a year, uh, the introduction of our hydroponic container uh, we are now on our 12th harvest from that, and it's the revenue that we generate from that operation that we plow back into our residential locations so that the entire system becomes self-sufficient. That's absolutely remarkable. Absolutely remarkable. Can you share a little bit about what inspires you most around your current work? Well, I think what inspires me most is the unforeseen downstream impact of what we're having. You know, we've seen individuals gain confidence in doing things that they have never done before. Uh, we've also, on the side, been able to create what we would call an employment zone that interconnects with the food that we were uh, creating. So whether it is a packaging center where our individuals will be involved with washing, weighing, packaging, labeling, and shipping out of uh, food uh, into the marketplace for which they are gamefully uh, employed and paid to do the work that they do, uh, all the way to a catering operation where again, we've partnered with a for-profit company who hires individuals from our own, uh, you know, our various group homes and apartment locations, uh, provides them training, paid employment. And again, their products also get out into the marketplace, providing more visibility for our organization 
which in turn can lead to more donations, more volunteers, other things like that. So it, it, it's really all of these downstream interconnected benefits that have really uh, continued to inspire me. That's incredible, sir. That's incredible. So let me ask another question. What challenges and barriers do you and your colleagues face? And what are some of the strategies or approaches you utilize to overcome some of these challenges? Well, I, th I think part of the challenges that we saw, especially as we try to grow our uh, model into neighborhoods around the greater Toronto area, was how difficult it was for organizations to start the project unless they were able to get some type of grant support to at least get things started. Then once you've got things started, you open up the opportunities to gain um, potentially donors or other people to help fund what you were doing and eventually through the sales of what you do, um, uh, replicate the, uh, you know, or overcome the operating costs of what you were doing. And so, you know, some of the challenges that we saw were organizations who absolutely and categorically refused to do anything if it affected their own cash flow, which meant, okay, that's fine. That fell into the strategy of make sure that you go out and apply for appropriate grants and you make your case around food security, around potentially employing someone to help do the watering uh, for the community group that you've helped put together. Um, we are now in uh, seven different communities beyond the borders of our arena organization. Uh, we have just completed uh, tomorrow, in fact, is the day when most of our organizations and newer ones who want to join us will be uh, submitting their applications for, in Canada, the New Horizons grant, which is aimed at uh, getting seniors more connected with their communities, getting uh, those in disadvantaged areas involved as well, um, and you know, doing projects that bring people together, whether in a homogeneous type community, you know, a, a synagogue, a church, a mosque, or you know, a, a, a community area, and more into a heterogeneous environment where people from all different walks of life, from all different parts of the uh, the general area can work together on the same project. So we, we are, we've we started essentially with a homogeneous approach, and now we are approaching a heterogeneous approach, including having some of our individuals working uh, at a farm that will be at a library across the street from where they live and meeting other people. So the idea is to break down barriers and to make people feel comfortable uh, working together with each other and maybe people they would not normally have seen or worked with. That's incredible. I recently, you recently shared a video with me that was truly inspiring of um, a few young people working in the garden in the morning, harvesting the food and actually being able to cook a meal that same day. My question to you is how do you feel about the future of food security and food sovereignty in Canada? I, I think there continues to be a challenge. The, the biggest challenge continues to be the business model. So on one side, you are making people feel good. You make them feel that they are contributing, which they are, uh, but they can only contribute to, uh, for so many months. You know, Essentially, our growing season is rather short. It runs May through September if we're lucky. Then what do you do with the rest of the time? So what we try to do is make sure that the crops that we grow um, can actually be put into other food that can be stored, preserved, canned, et cetera, and used over the winter season so that you're not just depending and that you grow enough that you can actually put some of it away. But that requires cooking skills, that requires other knowledge as well to be able to do that effectively. Um, that's one of, I believe, one of the ongoing challenges is how do you take a summer growing season, essentially, and stretch it to something that can run 12 months a year? One of the approaches we've taken is hydroponic, but that's not something that you can deploy you know, on a large scale. You can, however, deploy it in apartments. And we've seen that, um, some friends of mine uh, making that work as well. So that that really is what I see are some of the challenges going forward. That makes perfect sense. Do you have a set of key priorities right now in terms of your organization? Uh, well, overall, Rena has its priority of providing affordable housing to individuals uh, that have developmental disabilities, and that affordable housing is not just housing, but with integrated supports. So you're not, you know, you're not living by yourself. I think the priorities really are to make sure that uh, not only can we uh, build for our 
of the individuals that we support, but to share that knowledge with others uh, in our community as to how to go about it. It is not the easiest thing to do, to build your own housing and to do that in some affordable way. Uh, we are just embarking now on our third major building. We opened one during COVID, a 79 unit, uh, sorry, yeah, 70 nine unit uh, building with a mix of bachelor all the way to four uh, four bedrooms. Uh, 139 people will live there eventually once it's completely occupied. And now we're moving to our first high rise, a 19th story building that will uh, provide housing for 168 people with integrated supports. And part of that and part of the programming, it's not the whole programming that we do. We do arts and crafts, we do other things to work with our individuals, but that the garden program itself now just becomes a component of many things that we do here at RENA and becomes one of the best ways for us to interconnect with the surrounding community and get them to know us and for us to know them. That's absolutely beautiful. What is your ultimate goal and what does success look like to you and your colleagues? <laughs> for me, my ultimate goal was always the same even as I was at IBM, get something started get it up on its feet, and then step away and let it run itself. Because that, that to me is success. It's not building an empire. It's not building a giant you know, set of things. It really is, can you teach enough people to do it themselves so that it really is self-sustaining? And I can step off and move to some other project that needs to get done. And th that's what I used to do at IBM. I used to be called an entrepreneur over there. I'd work between departments. And that's the same thing that I do here at Rena. I work between our various departments to get things done with a common folk, the individuals that we have in our care, that we are making their lives better, their families' lives who love them also better. And and that's really what, what keeps me going, Victor. That really is what keeps me going. Well, congratulations. That's incredible. Do you have any closing thoughts or a call to action to Canadians? I would say, look, the, the main call to action is get involved in your community. There's always something that can be done. We happen to latch on food. There may be other things that you can do as well. But if you sit back and you wait for things to happen, nothing's going to happen. You've got to roll up your sleeves. You've got to be part of the community, whether your skill is grant writing, whether your skill is mentoring others, whether your skill is organizing activities get involved in your community and make sure that everyone is included. Do not discount somebody because of a disability and inability to be, uh, to do something because of the color of their skin, because of their sexual orientation. We are humanity. We have to work together. We have to live together. We have one planet and we got to get it right. Don't have much of a choice. Ashe, Ashe, Ashe. As our ancestor Maya Angelou says, nothing will work unless you do. So well, with those sentiments, I give thanks for your remarkable leadership, transparency, candor, and just your level of visionary excellence, Fred. Thank you so much for your time today. And we close the way we began this interview by acknowledging, giving thanks to our creator, to our ancestors, the original stewards of the various lands we're on. We also acknowledge all those who toiled without compassion or compensation. We acknowledge all the elders and community stalwarts whose shoulders we stand on as we build, share, and learn together for our collective liberation and sovereignty. Thank you so much, Fred.